Good morning. Let's give her a big round of applause. So excited to see all of you and so glad that all of you that have joined us by, by Facebook or by YouTube have done so. I want to welcome you to Chatsworth First Baptist Church. We have a QR code that's going to be up for you to be able to take a picture with your phone and when you do that and put your camera to it, there'll be a link that'll take you to our bulletin and there are a number of uh, announcements that you can read about. There'll be links that you can click on. We'll not be having a Wednesday evening meal again this Wednesday because uh, Miss Denise is still in rehab and of course we want to continue to pray for her but we will be having our regular Wednesday evening service at 630 and encourage all of you to come out and of course our regular youth and children's services. I have good news. $25,000 is what we've raised for our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Amen? Amen. I think Terry told me that was a record for us, and uh, at one point we thought it was 30000 but we had someone who graduated from Murray County adding, so, you know, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry. I always say that about Polk County, where I graduated from, so I thought I'd give her a little, little grief there. But anyway, Lynn Duncan's going to be starting a women's Bible study uh, the last week of January. There's more information about that in the bulletin. But we want to encourage you. It's a wonderful opportunity for discipleship from a great Bible teacher. We encourage you, if you can, to be a part of that. Um, another big announcement, and this is such an honor for our church, um, the president and the CEO of the Georgia Baptist Convention called me uh, a few months ago, and he asked if he could come and be with us in service. And he's going to be here on January the 23rd uh, for the morning service, uh, Thomas Hammond, uh, is his name and it is a tremendous honor for him to come and be with us and we want to honor him and I want to encourage all of you to be here for that service if you can at all and I want you to be praying for Dr. Hammond as he comes and he preaches to us and he shares with us just a little bit about what's going on at the Georgia Baptist Convention and uh, I've gotten to know uh, Dr. Hammond and his wife a little bit over the last few years and served with them on a, on a committee or so too and, and so I want you to be praying for that service and uh, as we uh, are excited about him coming and being a part of our, of our church service that Sunday morning. All of you should have received one of these, uh, something, a tract called the Romans Road and a little flyer pamphlet called Sowing the Seed of the Gospel. If you do not have one of these, would you raise your hand? We want to get you one. If you do not have these, even on the balcony, I think we covered everyone. We have a couple of people here that do not have them. We have a few people here in the, in the choir that do, that do not have them, and we can get those to them whenever they come out of the choir loft. Anyone else that does not have one of these? Um, this is our church-wide emphasis for 2022, sowing the seed of the gospel. If you'll just take this pamphlet, and I may cover this a little bit more uh, in the message this morning, but if you'll take this, there, there's going to be six different icons or uh, on the, front of your, uh, on the front of your pamphlet. The home, the neighborhood, friends, work and school, family tree, and community. Those are the fields that we're going to be focusing on sowing the seed of the gospel into. And our emphasis this year is being very intentional about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, beginning with our family. Jesus said that we are to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And Jerusalem is our home base. It's, it's really our family, and it's our extended family. Um, and it's our, our neighborhood. It's our Murray County. And as we started planning for this, we did so with Dr. Tim Smith, who came on a Sunday morning a, month, a few months ago. And Tim and I, uh, who is the director of missions uh, for what's Rome? what county is Rome in? Floyd County. Dr. Smith, uh, for 25, 30 years, worked for the, for the Georgia Baptist Convention, but he came here and uh, he emphasized and challenged us about getting out the gospel as we had a Sunday school emphasis, and he's done a number of videos that I've been showing to our teachers, at least one. And so we want to be very intentional. We're going to take about four to six weeks uh, on going and making sure our immediate family uh, is truly saved. For you parents, it gives you a wonderful opportunity to talk to your children about their salvation and just begin to bring them along if they're not at a point where they're ready for it. It also gives you an opportunity to talk to your mom and dad 
uh, and to your grandparents and even uh, to your siblings to make sure that you know when they die, they're going to be in heaven with you. And it also is a wonderful opportunity for you to make sure that you're truly safe, which we're excited about. So I'll be talking a little bit more about this in, in my message. As a matter of fact, I may not preach. I may just talk to you from my heart about some of these things and walk you through this track uh, on, on the Romans road and try to help you understand how you can help someone else come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. How many of you will be praying about this with me? Matthew 9, Jesus said this, Pray ye to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest for the fields. Listen, they're plenteous. The fields are white. They're ready to be harvested. And so as you and I pray to the Lord about sending labors into that harvest field, the first one that he may send is you and me. And then he will begin to burden the hearts of other people as they begin to go. One last thing, and I know this has been the eternal announcement time. We don't normally take this long. We have a number of opportunities that we're looking at, not just for our Jerusalem, but even to the uttermost parts of the world. I'll be going to Argentina and looking for some places that we're going to be trying to do a medical mission trip either at the end of 2022 or sometime in the fall of 2023. We also have some opportunities we're praying about in India and even in New Mexico. And I want you to be praying about that. We'll be talking to you about it as those opportunities uh, come along. But what an opportunity it is, an open door, not just in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but even in the uttermost parts of the world. And so I want to make you aware of those things. For this reason, I want you to pray about them, that God would give us direction and would give us a platform to be able to preach and share the gospel and preach the mysteries of Christ. And we appreciate so very much you doing that. Gary's going to come. He's going to lead us in worship. And I'm going to ask him if he would to pray for us this morning uh, and for our service, Brother Gary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a wonderful God you are to us. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your love for us. Lord, we do pray, uh, Lord, as we enter this season of sowing the seed of the gospel, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just impress on our hearts, Heavenly Father. Lord, create an earnest and fervent desire within us, Heavenly Father, to spread the seed of the gospel, to care about our loved ones, to care about the people around us, Heavenly Father, to care about the people that we work with in our families, all of the people that are in our community, and then all over the world, Heavenly Father. But we know that we need to, you need to create that desire within us, and we thank you for what you're going to do for that, Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for the sickness that is in our community, Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, that you would just keep your hand on us, that you would help people to stay well, uh, Lord, that you would heal those that, are, that have become sick with us. Uh, with the virus that, that is becoming more prevalent, Heavenly Father, and we pray for that. Now we pray is that as we go into this service today, Heavenly Father, that, Lord, we will be ever mindful of your blessings to us, and, Lord, that we will be open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us through your word and through Pastor Mark today. And we love you and thank you for all that you're going to do. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we begin our worship today as we sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Oh, um. 
showers of blessing that come from heaven above. Let's sing this great hymn this morning. There shall be showers of blessing. showers we plead. You know, uh, today's probably a good day to be singing showers of blessings because the, the raindrops are coming down outside and, and we're, we're just mindful that God's blessings continue to fall upon us. But you know, when we look at that rain, sometimes it's an inconvenience. Sometimes we get lots of it and it gets deep and we get problems with that. But we need the rain because the rain brings the, the, the water that we drink. The rain brings the, the water that feeds the, the crops and takes care of the plants and all the things that go along with that. So sometimes our blessings are not always what we think they are. And sometimes it's in those inconveniences in life that we can find our greatest blessings. I love this song. Please listen as one in the choir sing blessings. We pray for blessings, 
We pray for peace, comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while you hear each spoken need, yet love us way too much to give us lesser things. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes? To know your need. And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in a when we cannot feel you near We doubt your goodness We doubt your love As if every promise from your word is not enough And all the while you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights Are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not our home. It's not our home. What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is a revealing of a greater thirst this world can't satisfy. And what if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the darkest nights, are your mercies in disguise? Amen and amen. Thank you, Wanda. Wonderful job with that song. What if the, bless, if the raindrops and the trials of this life are our blessings in disguise? And we should be thankful for all of God's blessings, even when we sometimes don't recognize them. Let's stand together as we continue to worship in the day and sing, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness.
and reasons to bless the Lord to continue to praise Him today.
sometimes the Holy Spirit will just bring a verse of scripture to your heart. Uh, over and over while we were singing this morning, I had a verse at the end of Psalms, and I wanted to make sure I got it right. You remember the Psalm 51? It's the Psalm of Confession that David had after he had murdered Uriah the Hittite and he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. They had lost a child because of uh, all of this. God had chastened them. and He asked the Lord to forgive him. Nathan the prophet came in and rebuked him right there in the palace and said, you're the man, after he gave him a parable of a man going out and stealing someone's sheep when he had a lot. You remember the story, those of you that have been in church. What a great opportunity for me to say, boy, you need to have your children in church. You need to have your children in church and you need to have them in the church for this reason because when I mention a story like that, 75% of the kids today don't even know what I'm talking about because their parents don't have their children in church. We're losing a generation of kids. We're losing a generation of young people that don't know basic Bible stories because we think that Sunday school is not important anymore. Well, let me tell you, it is the most important thing that you'll ever do. It's more important than any ball game you'll ever attend. Now, boy, I wasn't planning on doing all this this morning, so you know the Holy Spirit has then got a hold of Brother Mark. So let me just go ahead and say it all that needs to be said. It's wrong. And you'll give an account before God. Because I'm telling you, the Lord wants your children and your youth in God's house so that they can learn the most important thing on the face of God's green earth, and it's not how to put a golf ball. Listen, I was coaching college ball when the Lord called me to preach. I know what it is to, to worship ball. And let me tell you where it leaves you empty. It leaves you void, looking for something else to fill it. The only thing that will ever fill it is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness? I feel like I'm in an African-American church. Of course, Taylor, go back to the organ. Dun, dun, dun. We... If you've never been in an African-American church, you don't know what that means. But let me just say this. It's important. Now, I want to say this to you. You say, Brother Mark, why did you go down Psalm 51? Because many of us, when we talk about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're embarrassed. How many of you ever made a mistake and sinned in front of someone else? <laughs> how, many ever, how many of you have been like Peter out by the fire and said a, said a basketball word, as I say? You said a cuss word. Done something you know in your heart you should not have done. And other people know about it. Well, may I tell you, no one, no one on the face of the earth knew more about the failure of David than the world, all of Israel, and everybody ever since because it's been written in the Word of God. But with all of that being known, he said, Dear Lord, wash me and cleanse me, and I'll be whiter than snow. And listen to what he says in verse number 13. He says, then I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. In the midst of all that failure, in the midst of all that embarrassment, in the midst of all of that sin, he said, Lord, if you'll just wash me, if you'll just cleanse me, if you'll just purify me, if you'll just restore me, he said, I want you to know something. He said, I want you to know that I will teach transgressors, that's the word for lost people, your way. And he said, I want you to know that sinners, people who have never known Christ as their Savior, they'll be converted unto thee. So don't use your sin as a reason to hide from this emphasis of our church this year. Don't use it. Because God's not going to let you. He didn't let David. He didn't let Peter. He didn't let Moses. He didn't let Paul. The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I, man, the things that I wish I wouldn't do, I do. All of them are exactly in the shoe leather you're in. They're sinners. And so am I. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed at some of the things that I've done. But yet, in God's sovereignty, we're tra teaching transgressors in the way and sinners are being converted into the, to him. And he wants to do the same thing with you. There was a man by the name of Robert Peary, he was an admirable, he was an admiral, and I'm sure he was admirable too. 
who is credited as being the first person ever to reach the North Pole. One of, one of his many expeditions to the north, he was traveling and heading north with a dog team. Boy, they were, they were on the move. At the end of the day, when he stopped to take his bearings on his latitude, he was very confused when he discovered that he had actually gone further south than he had been at the beginning of the day. Here he had run with the team north all day long. And after a lot of discovery, he realized that he was on a glacier, and that glacier was moving faster south than his dogs were moving north. Boy, he realized that he was further away from where he ever intended to be, further away from his goal. And I believe oftentimes the church, the modern-day church, is in the same situation. It's moving in a lot of directions, trying a lot of different programs, attempting a lot of different things. But all the while, it's getting further and further and further away from the goal that its founder had for it. And what is that goal? Well, it's Matthew 28. You all know it that have been in church. Go ye therefore into the world. Go, go and make disciples. He said it another way. He says, I want you to be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He said it about five different ways, Jesus did, before he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And what was he doing? He was saying, your marching orders, what you are supposed to be doing, is taking the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and you're to be sharing it with people. Now, oftentimes, in the Bible, you see this depicted as someone who is going out and sowing seed. Matthew 1, and verse number 6, it says, He that goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Here is the picture. It's a picture of, of, a, of a farmer back in the day, and, and he's got on a leather seed sack. And they would put a big leather sack and strap it around them, and they would, they would fill it full of wheat of wheat seed and, and they would go out into a field and they would begin to take handfuls and they would sow it all over the place. They would sow it and sow it and they would make sure that that entire field was covered with seed. And so many times whenever you begin to study your Bible, this is exactly the picture that Jesus Christ used in a, in a world that was very familiar with agriculture to convey the message that you need to be going about telling others about Jesus Christ. He says, first of all, he that goes forth. And it is assumed that you and I that have seed are going to go. Jesus said it, Matthew 13, 3, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. He's using the same imagery. And you would imagine that someone that had seed would do that. He said it another way in Matthew 28, 19. And the assumption is made that, listen, if you have seed, you're going to do it. And that seed, of course, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Haggai wrote this in Haggai 2.10, is the seed yet in the barn? And the idea there is, listen, you and I have left the seed of the gospel in the barn, and, and it's not out in the field. And what are the fields? It's the hearts of people. And for you and for me, and our emphasis, it's going to be the hearts of our family members for the next six to eight weeks. And then we're going to move it to the hearts of the people that are in our uh, workplace. And then we're going to move it to the hearts of the people in our neighborhood, or the field of our family, the field of our workplace, or the field of our neighborhood and we're going to go through six of those fields sowing the seed of the gospel is patterned for us throughout the new testament jesus left the portals of glory and may i tell you the scripture says that he came to seek and to save those who are lost he sent the disciples out he put, put them, listen, 70, he sent out two by two, and he sent them out into the field of humanity to sow the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was just assumed. Peter went to the, or Philip went to the Ethiopian eunuch. Peter went and he shared the gospel with Cornelius. You may remember that story. It is really 
where all of a sudden we see the gospel going to the Gentiles. And Jesus told Peter, he said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom, the keys of the gospel. You know what Peter did? He preached on the day of Pentecost and the gospel was open to the Jew. And then he went to Cornelius' house, who was a Gentile, and he stuck the key of the gospel in that man's heart and he opened it. And all of a sudden, the gospel of Jesus Christ was both to the Jew and to the Greek. All over the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ would flow. What about Paul? Two continents he touched with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may I tell you, he went and he grabbed that gospel seed and he threw it all over the place. And he said, I want you to know that as far as I know, in all of the region of Asia Minor is what he was talking about. He said, not one man's blood can be required at my hands because he had sowed the seed of the gospel. Andrew did it. The woman at the well even did it. You remember that lady? Man, she'd make some mistakes. Nobody wanted to talk to her. Nobody wanted to be around her. She was a woman who had been married five times to the person she was living with at that time. She wasn't even married to him. And Jesus looked at her and shared the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ with her and she was saved and the Bible says that she went back into the city and she began to sow the seed of the gospel in the city of Samaria and listen a whole multitude of the city came out and they were converted and all of them were rejoicing and praising God because this lady had the seed of the gospel planted into her heart and it sprang up to everlasting life and she took that same seed this treasure everyone say this treasure that we hold in earthen vessels, that treasure is the gospel. We're to go out and we're to, we're to sow that. That's where Jesus in John 4 looked at his disciples. And the disciples had just come back from the big V with some cheeseburgers. And, he, and, and listen, he said, I, they said, here, do you want something to eat? And he said, he said, I've got meat to eat that you know not of. He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And the will of him that sent him was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because he had come to seek and to save that which was lost. He was the faithful witness in Revelation 1. And he looked at those disciples and he said, say not that there are either three or four months and then cometh harvest. He said, look unto the fields for they are white already unto harvest. He said, they're ready. That lady that's waiting on you, she's ready. She's bringing you steak and she's bringing you big V and you need to be bringing her the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That guy that's changing your tires, let me tell you, he's putting on your tires and you ought to be putting the seed of the gospel in his heart. That's the way it is. This is God's plan. This is why the church so often is so far on a glacier moving away from the goal that God ever intended for it to have. That is to tell others about Jesus. Hey, listen, we're not going to get off on one ditch. I'm not bragging, but I mean, I've, I've had men mentor me so that we're not going to go in the ditch and all we're ever going to do is tell people about Jesus and never love each other and care for one another and fellowship and pray for one another and build up the body. It all works together. But listen, we can't be sitting in here fellowshipping and building up the body and getting all of this seed from the Word of God it is seed for the sower and bread for the eater. That's what the Bible's like and do. And if you're not careful, we'll eat so much, we'll never be willing to go and sow seed. So the scripture is so explicitly clear. Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. John 20, 21, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Where was he sending them? He was sending them out into the harvest field. The Gadarean maniac Listen, he had a legion in him. Oh, he had a bunch of demons living on the inside of him. The man was crazy. He had lost his mind. He was living in the, in the tombstones and cutting himself. And they had tried to chain him. He was so demon-possessed, he would break those chains. And he went, and Jesus cast those demons out of him. And the man was saved. And he said, Jesus, I want to follow you to the ends of the earth. He said, oh, no, 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 no. You go back and you tell your family. You go sow the seed of the gospel right there in your family to your mom and to your dad and to your brother and to your sister. You go sow the seed of the gospel to any children you may have. The disciples, Jesus said, and I've already quoted this, say ye not that it's four months and then cometh harvest, but look on them. They're already white in the harvest. 
Little boy was asked to go somewhere by his dad. Little boy looked at him and he said, I ain't going. It sounds like a couple of my kids. His dad did not like that kind of language. And I wouldn't either. And he said, son, you're not supposed to use the word ain't. That is not proper English. He proceeded to give him an English lesson. He said, now listen carefully. First person singular, I'm not going. Second person singular, you are not going. Third person singular, he is not going. First person plural, we are not going. Second per person plural, you are not going. Third person plural, they are not going. He said, now son, do you understand all of this? His son said, yes, sir, I do. It looks like ain't nobody going. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, that's what it looks like. It looks like ain't nobody going. They're not going to church. They're not going anywhere to do what they ought to be doing. They're not going out and telling others about Jesus. They ain't going. They're not going to the prayer time, to the Bible study time. They ain't going. The question is, is are we going to get going? Are we going to do the things that we know we're supposed to be doing? I thought about last week's message in light of this week. I thought about it. You know, we talked about getting dressed up. Sherry used to get so mad at me. Uh, I would go mow the yard, and I just, if you know me, I've gotten a lot better, but used to, I just wanted to get it done. So I would get out of the car, and I would just start mowing the yard after work. I'd have on my dress shoes, my dress pants. I'd, I'd, I'd just mow it. I had my mind on something. I was praying about something, so I'm just mowing it. She said, you are ruining all that. Would you start wearing overalls or blue jeans or something? Change it in your old shoes. I'm, said, I'm sorry, honey. I would do it over and over and over. You know, you need to get the right attire on for the right occasion. Amen? You don't wear overalls to run the 100-meter dash. Well, let me tell you something. Last week, we talked about getting dressed up. We talked about stop doing some things and start doing some things. You know why? Because those are the farm clothes of the believers so that we can go out and sow some seed and it be affected. We can go out and sow some seed if we'll stop doing some of those things we talked about last week. And if we'll start doing some of the things that we talked about this week. He that goes forth weeping. He that goes forth weeping. Jeremiah would put it like this, oh, that my head were waters, my eyes, fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Luke 19, 41, Jesus looked over the city and listened. He knew what was getting ready to take place. And the scripture says that Jesus wept over that city. In Joel 2, 17, he said, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Listen, the burden for souls ought to start with me. It ought to start with the leadership of our church. We ought to ask God, God, give us a burden for the lost. Let us cry again over people that have never trusted Jesus as their Savior and what sin is doing to them. I brought Nick Davis up on the platform a minute ago to ask him this question. Naso lacrimal. Is that correct? Is that naso lacrimal? That's a duck. Did I say it right? means I didn't say it right. <laughs> but let me tell you what, it's a duck, and out of that duck, tears flow. And those ducks will get stopped up sometimes. And listen to me, the tear ducks of the church have stopped up. And we don't need to, so, need to go see Nick. He's a great physician, but we need to go to the great physician, Jesus Christ. And we need to ask him to help us. Get the tear ducts unclogged so that we'll care about people dying and going to hell again. Amen. Lord Jesus, help me to care again. Help me to care again. And so, we go forth weeping. We're going, but we're going with a burden and compassion. And we're saying the prayer that Gary really prayed before I preached. Or before he sang and led worship. The Lord, give us that burden for souls. Lord, do something in our hearts. Give us that burden for souls. Then we go out sowing. And this is where he said, He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed. The seed is the Word of God, it's the Bible. I have tracks here for you to take. These tracks are tracks of the Romans Road. For you that have children, 
I want you to look at this track if you have a child. It's called Simple Steps. And you can pick these up in the back and it will help you with your children. Also, there's another one. It looks like this. This is for your middle schoolers and youth. It's the gospel, God's plan for me. You may want to take this and read through this and it may help you. But I want you to listen to me. The greatest theologian that ever lived on the face of the earth was the Apostle Paul. He wrote over half of your New Testament. Whenever the Apostle Paul stood before the most important people that you and I would consider the most important people on earth, the politicians and the Supreme Courts and the judges of his day, the the potentates as we would call them, he didn't go in to imputed righteousness. He didn't go into the doctrine of adoption. He just said, let me tell you a story. He said, I was on the Damascus Road. And he said, I was breathing out threatenings and slaughterings. And he said, there was a light that shone brighter than the noonday. And he said, it was Jesus Christ. And he smote me. And he said, who art? He, he, he said, Paul, why is it that you kick against the pricks? He said, who art you, Lord? And what would you have me to do? You know what he did? He told his testimony. He just shared what Jesus had done. And listen, I've given you this, and I'm going to go through it just for a quick second. It's the Romans road, and all this really is, is it's just a series of verses in the book of Romans that will help someone understand the basic things they need to understand in order to get saved. But let me tell you, you don't, if you don't have time to go through a track, and maybe you say, Pastor Mark, I don't know if I'm comfortable, well, just tell someone what Jesus did for you. Tell them a little bit about before you were saved, what it was like. Friley Whopper was here today, and he was on earth at Sherry's dad. He would look at someone, and he would say something like this. I was 16 years old, and I couldn't sleep for two weeks because I was afraid I was going to die. And he said, I knew if I, if I died, I wasn't going to go to heaven. And he said, my dad got up and preached, and that's Sherry's grandfather. He was a Baptist preacher and said, I, I went and I trusted Jesus as my Savior. And he said, I've never worried about dying again. Just a simple 30-second testimony. But here's another one. Open up your track with me. We're going to talk about sowing the seed of the gospel just for a second. I'm not going to take long. This Roman road simply shows the path to heaven. Number one, it says everyone needs salvation. Well, why is that? Because we're all sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. And whoever you're going to be talking to is a sinner too. It says, for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. You need to put this, put this with you. Put this somewhere that you can get it. Uh, someone said these shirts with pockets, these are track holders. That's what they're for, to hold gospel tracks. Someone, I don't know who said that. Does anybody know? Sumner Wimp said that. They're gospel tracks. Track holders. For you ladies, you may have to do something different. But look, you can pull this out and, and, and you can just say, listen, Ava, come up here for a second. Huh? Come on. Don't be, don't be embarrassed. Just you and me. Ava, she plays basketball at North Murray. She's a very neat, mean person and needs Jesus, so we're going to try to help her. Ava, now you and I have been talking. Let me just share this with you. Right here, number one, it says that all who sin should fall short of the glory of God. And I know it's going to be hard for you to believe, but I'm a sinner. And you know, I'm not just a sinner, but you are too. Have you ever told a lie? Yes, I have. I have too. I've told a lie before. But the Bible says the good news is this, but God, he demonstrated his own love towards you and me and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, the whole reason that Jesus came was Jesus came to die for your sin so that you wouldn't have to pay the penalty of that sin. And you know, you may think, you know, Pastor Mark, there's so many things I need to do. I need to, I need to go over and see this person and talk to them, or I need to stop doing this, or I need to start. I've just not been reading my Bible enough. And Pastor Mark, I, I've, not, I, I've just not done this enough and that enough. No, 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 no. You don't do anything to get saved, Ava. The Bible says that salvation is a gift. Look, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, Ava salvation you're a sinner and Jesus died for your sin and you don't have to earn your salvation you just have to accept the fact that Jesus really did die he was buried and rose again now one of the things that you need to understand Ava is you know that you're sorry for your sin 
you know, you realize that it's your sin and my sin that put Christ on the cross. And the, the idea of repenting means to just simply turn from that sin. But notice what it says. It says that we're saved. It's a gift and that we're saved by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Mm. You say, Pastor Mark, what does that mean? Well, grace is the favor of God. It's something that you and I can't earn. God just has given us, given us his favor. Someone put it like this. It's God's riches at Christ's expense, grace. But the bottom line you need to understand is this, that your forgiveness of sin is a gift. It's a gift. And look at this. It comes through faith. To him who believes, on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteous. Now, this is just simply saying, Ava, if you believe on Jesus Christ who justifies the ungodly, then your faith, your belief is counted for righteousness. Now, that is a good deal, Ava. Let me tell you what that means. That means if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you're given the gift of Christ's righteousness. And he takes away your sin. Is that not a great deal? That is. Now, we're not just into deals. We're into giving our life to the Lord. But I want you to understand that you don't earn your acceptance before God. It is a gift that is given to you. And how can, how can that be? Because that's the way God made it. That's the way God set it up. That's the way God planned it. And God saves all who call upon him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, there are a few main things I want to talk to you about, Ava. I'm going to put this to the side. Ava, number one, you have to realize you're a sinner. And you have to admit that. You've done that. Number two, you have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. I believe you've already done that, but in this instance, we're going to pray that you play, play that you haven't. So, if you admit you're a sinner and you believe that Jesus died on your died for your sins, then Ava, if you'll just simply repent of your sin and ask Jesus Christ to save you, then He will. Let's give Ava a big hand. Now listen, now listen, that's it, that's it, that's it. it. That's it, it's that simple. ABC is the way they've done it in vacation Bible school for years, and, and it's tough. The Romans Road, uh, it's good. You can follow that and lead someone to Christ, but listen to me, listen to me. Do you know if your grandchildren are going to go to heaven? Do you know that? Do you know they really understand the gospel? You need to make sure they understand the gospel. You need to make sure that your children understand the gospel. To those of you that have children, let me give you some advice that was given to me 25 years ago, and I've never forgotten it. I want you to listen to me. Dr. John MacArthur said this, and I've never forgotten it. He said, so often parents focus on the symptoms, and they never focus on the cause and the real problem. So I'm going I'm to tell my children, don't you lie. Don't you do this. Don't you do that. All of those are symptoms. Them not honoring you as parent. Them telling lies. Them doing things that they know they should not do. Young people, listen to me. All of that is the symptom of the one big problem you have in your heart called sin. Now, I remember Dr. MacArthur said, you need to focus on the heart of the issue, and that is in their heart they are sinners and they have sin. Yes, correct the behavior, but if all you ever do is correct the behavior and never deal with the issue of sin, listen, you're never preparing them for salvation. You're not preparing them. That they need changed, not just their action. Because salvation is where you and I are changed. That's the seed. It's powerful, the word of God is, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. This book is an incorruptible seed. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, it's like a hammer. It breaks the rocks and pieces. You find somebody that's hard-hearted, not interested in the gospel, you just keep hammering them with the word of God. Do you know that it takes seven times, most of the time, this is what 
this is what they, they say, those that study these things. Seven times someone is presented with the gospel before they ever trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. I was reading someone this week, and they were telling a story about sitting on a, uh, a friend of theirs sitting on the airplane and leading a man to Christ. And he was talking to this pastor friend and telling him about it. And the pastor friend said, well, where's he from? And he said, where? He said, really? And he was an Indian man. And he says, really? He said, well, that's amazing. He said, yeah, he works for this company. He said, really? What department? He said, what's that guy's name? And two months before that, that pastor he was sharing with had sat on a plane and shared the gospel with that Indian man. One sowed, one reaped, they both rejoiced. In the morning sow your seed. In the evening, don't hold back your hand. And when you do that, you'll come rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with it. If you sow the gospel, listen, you water that gospel with te tears. Horticulturists tell us that, boy, if, you, if you'll water, if you'll put seed in water and let them soak, it seems like they do even better. Listen to me. If we water the, the seed of the gospel with tears, burdened over lost souls, and we sow it, the Bible says that doubtless you'll come again rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with him. And Jesus said, one will sow and one will reap, and they will both rejoice together. And that's what we want to do, amen? We want to rejoice together. You say, Pastor Mark, well, what about good works and doing good to people? Oh, it's important. It's what many people call a social gospel. And the social gospel is where you just simply do good. It's where you feed them at soup kitchens and you clothe people. You give them things they need, but you never get to the heart of the gospel. You never share with them the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the great evangelist, Dr. Vance Habner, said this. If they had a social gospel in the days of the prodigal son, someone would have given him a bed, a sandwich, and a welfare check, and he never would have gone home. Listen, sometimes the greatest thing you'll ever do for someone is share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And any good works that you do or I do, it is there for a platform to tell them about Jesus Christ. It's not just to feed them. It's not just to clothe them. That's why with every uh, box of food that we give out at our church, we include a gospel track with that. We try to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, I want to ask you a question. Are you going to sow the seed of the gospel for the next six to eight weeks in the field of your family? I want you to go home and I want you to say, Pastor Mark, I'm going to be intentional about this. I'm going to be praying about specific people. I'm going to ask God to burden my heart about somebody in my family that I need to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with. I want to make sure that my husband knows for sure that he's going to go to heaven, that we know for sure that there's no doubts about the day that we were saved, where we got saved. I'm going to talk to my children. I'm going to make sure they know, or at least they're beginning to understand if they're smaller. As Gary comes, I'm going to close with this. Some of you parents that have little ones, I want you to listen to me. I know you're scared about them making a profession of faith and them not really truly being saved. We all want to be careful with that, and we don't want to be negligent, and we don't want to be haphazard with that in any way. But I remember I made a profession of faith at the age of five. I've told you the story. I was sitting on the, on the front row, and I got too far. I was, it was during invitation time. I was five, and I was just wandering around, walking, probably, probably counting something on the carpet. And I, I opened my eyes, or I looked up. I had my eyes open. I looked up, and I realized I was about two feet from the altar and about 10 or 12 feet from the front pew. Well, I thought everybody was watching me. I froze. Scared me to death. Well, I went to the altar and started crying. Well, they rejoiced all over Bradley County. Thought I got saved. <laughs> they didn't know, and I wasn't going to tell them. Somebody baptized me. I was five. Well, the Holy Spirit knew. He knew. I knew. As Brother Sammy used to say, the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. Listen, he's not going to let you or me or anyone die and go to hell without warning us. He's going to let it be known and let them know. Now, I'm not saying be haphazard. 
I'm not saying not be diligent, none of that. I'm saying don't walk in fear with that. Some of my children got made professions of faith at a very young age. If those professions weren't real, I am, I've just got enough faith in the Lord and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that He will make that known to them. He'll make that known to them. The one thing I would assure them of is if you ever doubt this, don't be afraid of telling me. It's not a big deal if you don't really think you got saved this time. And I want to say that to you adults. If you really don't think you've been saved, it's not a big deal. The old devil will try to make it a big deal in your mind. Well, what do people want to think? Who cares what anybody thinks except for Jesus? And anybody that's got a lick of sense will be happy for you. Amen? Amen. So don't you ever let that keep you from being, making a profession of faith on the inside. Goodness gracious, I'm rambling on. Let me shut up and pray. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for loving us and caring for us. And Lord, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the boldness that you give me sometimes, God. To say the truth. The Lord Jesus, let us come rejoicing, bringing in the shoes. Let us come rejoicing. Lord, before we can do that, let us go out with hearts heavy, with the seed of the Word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ watered down because we love people. We don't want our, our neighbors and our friends and our family members to die and go to hell. The Lord Jesus, I don't want anybody in this place to go to hell. I love them. And I pray to the Lord Jesus Christ that if they're not saved, today they will be. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You stand. If you need to come and pray, you come.
Well, we appreciate all of you being here. I didn't know if any of you just wanted to go out and hang out tomorrow night, maybe go eat some pizza around 7 or 8 o'clock. I know there's nothing big going on or anything. Uh, I appreciate you being here, and I appreciate you taking part in this emphasis in our church. And I pray that all of you have a glorious time this afternoon and a wonderful day. All of God's people said, Amen. We'll do a going home song when we're Amen. Let's ready. sing as we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. Yeah.